The Beneficent Burglar by Charles Neville Buck A Call for Help The agitated transit of Mer Lewis Copewell through the anteroom of the Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow created a certain stir. With all the lawless magnificence of a cum that runs amok through the heavens, he burst upon the somewhat promiscuous assemblage already seated there. The assemblage sat in dumb and patient expectancy. Quite obviously it was a waiting list, already weary with enforced procrastination. Its many eyes were anxiously focused on the door that sequestered the great man in the aloofness of his sanctum. A young woman gazed across her typewriter at the supplicant seeking audience, with a calm hauteur which seemed to say, Wait, varlets, wait, the great do not hurry. They returned her gaze sullenly, but in silence. None ventured to penetrate beyond her desk to the portal forbiddingly placarded. None, that is, until Mer Cupwell arrived. Where's Alec? Demanded that gentleman, mopping his perspiring brow with a silk handkerchief. I want to see him quick. The young woman looked up blankly. She knew that Mer Cupwell and her employer were in their private capacities on terms of intimacy, but duty is duty, and law is impartial. Many persons wanted to see him quick. Since the triumph of civic reform had converted the attorney who paid her salary from a mere elect, who was even as other elects, into Alexander the Great, she felt that his friends in private life must adapt themselves to the altered condition of affairs. Accordingly her Ripley came with frigid dignity. Mur Burrow instructed that he was not to be, on any account, interrupted. Into Mur Copewell's surprised voice crept the raucous note that the poet describes as like the growl of the fierce watchdog, the young woman became glacial. Mur Burrow can't see you, the glance which Mur Copewell bent on this deterring female for a moment threatened to thaw her cold reserve into hot confusion. The waiting assemblage shuffled its feet, scenting war. At the same moment the private door swung open and Mur Burrow himself stood on the threshold. At the sight of him several gentlemen who were patriotically willing to serve their city in the police and fire departments came respectfully to their feet. One contractor, who had for sale a new paving block, saluted in military fashion. Mur, Lewis Copwell took a belligerent stride toward the door as though he meant to win through by force of assault. But Mur, Burrow made violence unnecessary. His smile revealed a welcoming row of teeth which in modern America means delighted. Trot right in, old chap. He supplemented. The young woman looked crestfallen. She felt that her chief had failed to hold up her hands in the stern requirements of discipline. Good morning, everybody. Rushed on Mer, Burrow, with a genial wave of his hand and a smile of benediction for the waiting minions. This second Alexander the Great knew that you can abuse a man's patience if you are a person of importance and smile blandly enough. Some of the Tsars could even massacre and remain popular, but they had to smile very winningly. Terribly busy. Must make all interviews brief this morning. Went on the new dictator. Must get over to the city hall. Then in view of congealing acidity on the visages of three newspaper men, he added, since no man is great enough to offend a reporter, I'll have a big story for you boys tomorrow. You know I'm your friend. He swept Mer Copwell into the private office and the door slammed on his smile. I have been sitting here for an hour already. Confided Alderman Grotz to his next neighbor. The Alderman's heavy lids blinked with a stolid bovine disapproval. De more I wait, de more I do not see him. It is not right. Alderman Grotz was reported to carry the lager and Bratwurst vote about in the pocket of his ample, plaid waistcoat. Such discrimination against him was venturesome politics. That guy that went in there ain't like us. 
explained Tommy Devran, whose florid oratory had been the matching's prized asset until the drift of political straws had guided him toward reform. He wears silk halfos where you and me wears cotton socks. This here is a classy, highbrow administration. Myself not being no cotillion leader, I'm going to beat it. The Han Thomas rose and beat it in all the majesty of affronted dignity. Inside, Mur Copewell threw his hat and stick on the desk and himself into a chair. He commenced to speak and suddenly stopped. A fine flow of high-pressure language was arrested by the sight of Chief of Police Swager sitting just across the room. The chief rose and took up his gold-trimmed cap. The new administration had added to the pulchritude of its police officials by more jaunty uniforms. The colonel felt conscious of a distinguished and military bearing. I'm going to shift Captain Garvey from the tenderloin if you don't object. Mur Burrow did not object. He did not know who Captain McGarvey was, but that fact he did not mention. What for, chief, what for? He inquired brightly. His air was that of a field marshal for whom no little thing is too small to merit consideration. Thoughtfully pursued Colonel Swager. I doubt if he's on the level. Oh, I haven't got him dead to rights yet, can't prefer charges. McGarvey's a matchain holdover, and he's likely to be a little blind in one eye where some of the thieves and yeggs that used to buy protection are concerned. Rat Connors was seen last night down at Corkill's place. You know Rat Connors? Mur Burrow had not that honor. The name was not on the membership books of his clubs. Let's see. He repeated carefully, Rat Connors, Rat Connors. I don't at the moment seem to place him. Second story man, drum snuffer, stone pincher, port climber general all-round expert. Illuminatingly itemized the chief, variously wanted for a large assortment of felonies. McGarvey ought to have ditched him. Agreed, Mur Burrow. Mur Copewell petulantly shifted in his chair. These matters seemed to him extremely trivial in view of his own more engrossing affairs. This Connor's party. Enlarged the chief, halting a moment by the door and inspecting with pride the gold oak leaves that went around his cap like a garland of greatness. He's a solemn little runt with one front tooth broke and one finger gone off the left hand. He's got straight black hair and a face like a rat. He looks like a half-witted kid but he's there with the goods. Go right after him, chief. He authorized, I give you carte blanche. Exit the chief, and in his wake appears at the door the accusing face of the young woman stenographer. Alderman Grotz insists. Impossible! Sighed Mur, Burrow dropping into an easy chair. I'm rushed to death just now. He gazed off across the roofs and searched his pockets for a cigarette. Let him wait, let him all wait. That's good politics. Then, turning to Copewell, whose frantic pacing of the floor disturbed his composure, he demanded, What's your trouble? Exploded the visitor. Trouble? Why, it's plural multiplied by many, then squared and cubed and... Well, just for a starter, give us one or two and build up from that. Suggested Mur Burrow placidly. Another girl, I'll bet, snorted Mur Copewell. There isn't any other girl. All the rest are counterfeits. There never was but one girl, and I'm going to lose her. This with deep stress of tragedy. Certainly, I'll help you. Mur Burrow waved his cigarette with airy assurance. But what's the matter? Can't you lose her yourself? On the facetious and honorable Alexander Murr, Copewell permitted the withering blight of his scorn to beat for one awful moment in silence, then he proceeded to enlighten. I've got to steal this girl, or it's all off. You've got to help steal her. Murr Burrow appeared shocked. But my dear lad, he demurred. I'm supervising a police force and a city administration in the interests of righteousness with a larger. I doubt if it would be just exactly appropriate for me to go into the girl-stealing business on the side. 
all politicians steal. A dogmatized Moore, Cupwell, who had failed to be properly impressed with the piety of the new administration. It's time you were learning your new trade, explained Mur Burrow with a smile. I have subordinates who, I tell you this is serious, interrupted the other tempestuously. I'm very busy. Evasively suggested the new political power. If you're too busy to help an old friend who needs you, stormed Mur Copewell, you can eternally go to. Hold on! Hold on! placated the other before Mur Copewell had enjoyed the opportunity of designating the locality to which Mur Burrow had his permission to go. I merely meant to point out that when you want something done, it is well to go to a busy man. The other kind never have time. The plot of an elopement. Mur Copewell crossed and stood tensely before Mur Burrow. When he spoke it was with the hushed voice of a man who divulges an unthinkable conspiracy. They are going to send her to Europe. You don't tell me. Observed Mur Burrow pleasantly. Well, what's the matter with Europe? Mur Copewell looked as much astonished as though he had been suddenly called on for proof that purgatory is not pleasant in August. His voice almost broke. They are sending her so that she may forget me. You can send a girl to Europe, reassured his friend. But you can't make her sane. They don't have to make her sane. She is perfectly sane now, retorted Lewis with commendable heat, inquired the lawyer logically. Should it be necessary to send her to Europe? It's not necessary. It's hideous. Emotion strangled Mur Copwell. They are packing her off because she loves me. Mur Burrow's voice was apologetic. I thought you said she was sane. Mur Copewell's Ripley may be omitted. In fact, the editor insists upon its being omitted. The following is an inadequate indication of its tenor. Going to send her to Europe. Mused Mur Burrow as though he had not heard. Then he inquiringly raised his brows and added, Oh! What? repeated Mur Copewell, bewildered. Who are they going to send to Europe? You are insufferable. That's precisely what I've been telling you, the one girl Mary, of course, Mary Asherton. The Honorable Alexander Hamilton spoke soothingly. You just said the only lady in the world. You didn't say which only one. Statistics show that in America alone there are perhaps twenty millions. Breathed Mur Copewell with fervor. Mary is a grand old name. Recitatively acknowledged Mur Burrow. Who objects to this match between you and this young person, Mary? Her family fathers, mothers, uncles, aunts, everybody like that. Then I gather from your somewhat disjointed statement. Mur Burrow summarized with concise courtroom clarity. That the situation is this, it is practically an unanimous verdict that the marriage is undesirable, ill-advised, and impossible. On the contrary, both Mary and I know. Mur Burrow raised a deprecating hand and interrupted. I said practically unanimous. I admit, of course, that you and the young woman hold dissenting opinions. There is always a minority report. I'm not trying to marry the majority. I'm not a Turk. How long have you known this particular only one? How long an interval elapsed between introduction and proposal? A month. Mur Burrow groaned. Abject surrender. No brave defense of your heart, no decently stern resistance. Why, Stussel held Port Arthur a hundred days and more though he was hungry. After a momentary pause, he inquired sternly. If you proposed eleven months ago, why in thunder are you just now planning this abduction? It took her some time to decide. It didn't take you long, poor creature. Mur Burrow stood at a stick of sealing wax with a judicially wrinkled brow. He generously exceeded. 
I'm not censuring the young woman. It's the female vocation to lure men. Can't blame them. Can't blame spiders for weaving filmy traps. But I am very, very sorry for flies and fools that rush in where angels fear the web. I don't need your sympathy. It's merely crass ignorance. Snapped Mer, Copewell. If you only knew her, snapped Mer, burrow back at him. But I know her sex. I know that women differ from other birds of prey in only one particular, and the distinction is in favor of the other birds of prey. That's a lie, of course, but I haven't time to argue it. Calmly pursued Mer, Burrow. That the others wear their own feathers. Women wear those of the others. The office door opened. The head of the young woman stenographer appeared. Her voice was chilling. Say to Mer, Grotz. Replied the Hon Alexander Hamilton in a voice loud enough to carry. That it is very good of him to wait. If he'll indulge me just ten minutes longer. His voice trailed off ingratiatingly as the door closed, and he turned again on his visitor. No woman in the world could reduce me to so maudlin a condition in a month. No, nor in a century. Now, having warned you in behalf of friendship, I'm entirely ready to help you ruin yourself. What's the idea? This was the moment for which Mer Copewell had waited. He began with promptness. Mary has telephoned me. She lives in Perryville, 250 miles away. They won't let me see her. They won't let him see her. Commiserated Mer, Burrow with melancholy. This trip to Europe was planned on the spur of the moment. It was meant to surprise us. It did. She starts tomorrow, unless... Unless you interfer today. Prompted Mer, Burrow, Mer Copewell became intense. She slipped away from home when she learned it, and we planned it all by phone. I can't go to Perryville, they would watch us both. I must stay here till the last minute and establish an alibi. Mary leaves there this evening on the train that reaches here about midnight, which makes no regular stops between. She starts unaccompanied, but is to be met at the station here in Mercerville by her aunt, Merce Stone, who is to chaperone the European trip. It is to be strictly and personally conducted. Grinned Mer Burrow. I can recommend her as a reliable duenna but I leave here on a train that starts west at the same time hers starts east. Those trains pass each other about halfway. Both are through expresses and neither makes any regular stop between Mercerville and Perryville. Once the plan involved action, the Han, Alexander Hamilton Burrow became interested. I have got, quite secretly of course, an order from the train dispatcher's office. In pursuance, my train stops at Jaffa Junction, which it reaches at ten o'clock tonight. Her train also stops at Jaffa Junction forty minutes later. We both disembark. When Auntie goes to the Mercerville station, there will be no Mary there. Almost you had persuaded me. But if any additional shred of evidence were necessary to establish the lunacy of this enterprise, it is the selection of Jaffa Junction as an objective point for elopement. Were you ever in Jaffa Junction? A tank, a post office, and a streak of mud. It may lack certain advantages. Defended Mer, cope well. But it is a strategic position. You don't seem to grasp the strenuousness of this undertaking or the peril. Mary is sent across the ocean on twenty-four hours' notice. She is put on the train at Perryville by her family. The train does not, so it is presumed, stop till it reaches here. Here a grim, relentless aunt catches her on the fly and keeps her bouncing. Good heavens, man, the only chance I have is train robbery in between, and Jaffa Junction is gloriously in between. What part do I play in this praiseworthy enterprise? Do you want my police to lock Auntie up so that she can't telephone to Mama? Worse than that. 
when we drop off that train at Jaffa Junction, unless we have some way to beat it quick, our last predicament will be worse than our first. We will need an automobile and a trustworthy chauffeur. He can also be best man and officiate at swearing to things when we get the license. You and your six-cylinder car have been elected. Are you quite sure? Inquired Mer, Burrow in a chastened voice. That you don't overestimate my merits. I am willing to give you a try. It would be nice and considerate if we could get it all finished up in time to wire Auntie that we are perfectly well married before she grows hysterical about Mary. Mary is very fond of her family and would appreciate a little attention like that. And have you considered the time it takes to drive 120 miles over those infernal hull-backed roads? Queried Mur, Burrow with suspicious politeness. Really, I can't say, but it's only ten o'clock now. You can start as soon as you're ready, you know. You have about thirteen whores. I sell them before your unparalleled nerve. Do you realize that I have public duties to perform? The stenographer's brown head was thrust into the door. Alderman Grot says, Send him right in. Exclaimed Mur, Burrow energetically. Ah, oh, Murgrat, I'm very sorry indeed to have kept you waiting. Miss Farish, tell the other gentlemen I have just received urgent news that will call me out of town until tomorrow. Phone over to the city hall and make my apologies to the mayor. Call up the garage and have my car ready for a long trip in a half or telephone to my rooms and have my man pack a suitcase and rush it over to the garage. Let's see, yes, I believe that's all, thank you. On the way to Jaffa Junction. The allegation that love laws at locksmiths has become more generally accepted than verity warrants. In point of fact the locksmith has never been altogether without the honors of war, and during the last century or two he has made commendable progress in the matter of bolts and tumblers and burglar-proof devices. Love was supervising the packing of Mary Ashton's steamer trunks and was particularly interested in the single suitcase surreptitiously intended for the Jaffa Junction Trussio. Love giggled as he looked on, but the giggle was rather hysterical. He likes that black gown, said Mary alone in her room with Love. I wore it the evening he proposed the last time. No, it was the third from the last time. The small god, Love approved of Mary. Her red-brown hair, hanging in braids, was very thick and long. About her temples were soft, tendril-like curls of the variety that is most valuable to love in his business, because they are more enmeshing and binding than some of the other links he is supposed to forge with the aid of his stout smith, Hyman. He approved of her deep violet eyes, liquid with the electric potency of personality. He approved of her willowy slenderness and the grace of her carriage. Love made an inventory of these assets, for like Napoleon Bonaparte he was arraying his forces against all Europe. As he realized the enormity of the proposition he sternly set his chubby features and clasped his hands at his back in a truly Corsican attitude. There was no room in the suitcase for his favorite gown. Mary Ashton sighed deeply as she acknowledged it. She felt that in the unfortunate matter of paucity of raiment, the late Miss Florum Flimsy of Madison Square had nothing on her. There was a hazardous point ahead which the god was gravely considering. Mary would be entrusted to the personal care of the conductor, and that functionary might feel warranted in asking questions when his fair young charge desired to leave the train late at night, unchaperoned and unescorted. Mary was thinking of that too. Now if Captain MacDonald was in command of this run, all might yet be well. MacDonald knew her very well and liked her very well and was gifted with susceptibility and kindliness. But if Captain Fellow was in charge, peril loomed large ahead. Fellow spelled duty with heavy, black capital letters. Had he lived in the old Salem days, his hymn-singing basso would have boomed loud and devout over all lesser sounds whensoever there was a skull-ducking or a witch-burning. Mary had never run away with a man before. 
she felt poignantly sensible of her inexperience. The fact that she was running away with an absent man made it even harder. Finally she was on the train. Looking through dark windows she found herself taking a dark view of life. She was frightened. If a woman is not frightened on her first elopement, she is likely to be unfeminine. Presently the conductor came and dropped to the arm of the next chair. Providentially it was MacDonald. So you're going to take a tour, Miss Mary? Was his original remark. Mary smiled. She wanted to cry, but she had to win the captain. And she had found that her smile was usually an effective way to begin. If that failed, she could cry later. You know, Miss Mary. The conductor's eyes grew reflective. I thought now and again it's strange you don't get married. He hastened to add with gallantry. I'm sure it ain't for lack of opportunity. Mary gasped, then she leaned forward and laid her hand on the conductor's arm. Are you a really truly friend of mine? She demanded in a catchy, half-subbing voice. Any time you ain't got a ticket you can ride with me. But I guess you'll marry one of them Marquises or Dukes, and after that you'll ride on them dinky European trains with tin engines. There are times when good men swear, merely because polite language fails of forcefulness. At such cries is vigorous young woman, being denied that form of superlative, have recourse to slang. You've got another guess coming, said Mary stoutly. I'm pleased to hear you say so. Captain, there's plenty of good young men in America. I'm, I'm going to marry the best of them tonight. Confided Mary, I'm running away this very minute. He's going to meet me at Jaffa Junction. The trainman's face clouded dubiously. The girl's heart began beating panic time. The dice of fate were rolling. Your folks don't know about this. She shook her head. They, they drove me to it. Who's your young man? Asked the, she informed him. Captain. MacDonald sat pondering inscrutably for a long while. The girl's brace heaved convulsively in suspense. The small god stood by in Napoleonic posture, but whether it was the posture of Austerlitz or Waterloo he did not himself know. I don't see nothing the matter with me, cope well, ma'am. The man at last adjudicated. But I promise to see you safe to Mercerville. It's apt to look kind of careless like to lose a young lady that's put in your charge. The conductor's face brightened. It was a new situation, and he was willing to avail himself of technical defenses. Then I guess you can do what you like, but I wish you hadn't told me in advance. I was afraid. Navely explained Mary Asheton. You wouldn't let me get off at Jaffa Junction. Again the train director thought deeply. Finally he announced himself. I'm ordered to stop my train at Jaffa Junction. I don't know who gets off there, see. But the brakeman will open up the vestibule door and may you never regret it, ma'am. A tragedy of errors. While these matters were transpiring, the Sister Express was rushing west. On the westbound train, Captain, Fallow chanced to be in command, and Fallow was peeved. Sundry irritating delays had marred his run from Pittsburgh. His firemen had been hefting coal into the engine's cavernous maw in a titanic effort to mend the timelesses. The locomotive had been roaring along with a streaming wake of black smoke lying level from its stack. At Mercerville only twenty minutes were left standing in the way of a perfect score. And at Mercerville the conductor had received orders to stop at an ungodly and forlorn tank tone in the midst of emptiness, known by the opprobrious name of Jaffa Junction. Fellow was fully prepared to be irascible with the Jaffa Junction party. Accordingly, when he discovered Mer, Lewis Copewell in the last seat of the last coach he eyed him without enthusiasm. I believe, Captain. Commented Mer. Copwell pleasantly. You have instructions to drop me at Jaffa Junction. Captains. 
glance became flinty. So you are that Jaffa Junction party? The manner of saying it indicated that the designation carried black opprobrium. Murr, Copewell nodded complacently. Fellow's stern visage became more granite-like. My train is twenty minutes late now. He accused, and that J-Town is one of them places where a lot of lame old ladies tries to board the train every time you stop there. It takes a Jaffa Junction prominent citizen five minutes to climb into a coach. Murr, Copwell politely attempted to simulate an interest in the characteristics of Jaffa Junction's prominent citizens. He said, Captain. Fellow went on curtly. I ask you as a favor to hop off quick when we get there. I'll have the rear vestibule open and you can fly out as soon as you feel the train slowing down. Your place will be our only stop this side of Perryville, see? If you can jump down without our coming to a dead stop, it will save time. My dear captain. He reassured. I hold various championships for getting off trains. Tonight I mean to break all my past records. I'm in a hurry myself. Fellow's face softened. Remember, he emphasized. First stop is your destination. In view of the fact that he was on his way to meet the one lady of his heart and to foil fate and family, Mer, Copewell might have been presumed to be wide awake. In point of actuality, the reverse was true. Last night, anxiety and indignation had murdered sleep. Today, action and preparation had assaulted his vitality. Now, with success at his elbow, a delightful languor stole upon him. Gradually his rosy dreams became rosier, more somnolent. His head fell on his chest. Behold, the bridegroom fell snoring. Some time later the conductor passed through the train, and, arriving at the front vestibule of the front coach, made a discovery. There, crouching very modestly in the shaded corner next to the rear end of the baggage car, was a somewhat undersized youth with straight, black hair and an expression of innocence which somehow did not seem to sit naturally on his rat-like countenance. The conductor eyed him accusingly. Where's your ticket? he inquired without preamble. The youth smiled with a disarming candor. He confided. You can search me. I was just going through me clothes for it when you come out. I was just saying to myself, son, says I, we're in his dad ducket. Ducket hell. <laughs> Repeated, follow, there was a pitiless inquisitorial note in his voice, which the young man construed as ominous. The young man bit his lip in annoyance. It was borne in upon him that he had made a most unfortunate choice of words. In polis glossaries the term is defined as thief and hobo vernacular for a railroad ticket. You come up front with me, suggested the conductor, pushing the youth ahead of him, in the baggage a coach ahead, Mer. Connors, for it was none other than he, was treated to a very creditable amateur production of the third degree. But Mer, Connors had made his one mistake, and they wrung from him no further self-incrimination. He was unaccustomed to the ways of travel, he said, because he had to stay at home and work very hard to support a widowed mother and several small brothers and sisters. He had lost his ticket. He had no more money. He was sorry, extremely sorry, but what could he do? He could get off, the conductor assured him, and to emphasize the suggestion he reached for the cord and signaled to the engineer. Mur Connors stood supinely near the open door of the baggage coach while the baggagemen and a brakeman ranged themselves at his back to assist him in alighting. The train slowed down with a jarring wrench which startled Mur Copwell out of a halcyon dream into a disturbed sense of being almost too late. Wildly seizing his hat and grip, he made a lunge through the open vestibule door. It was a highly creditable lunge. It carried him from a flat-footed nap out into the darkness in something like two seconds and a quarter. He was not yet really awake. He acted subconsciously and in obedience to a sense of imperative hest. 
When he landed, blinking on the side of the track and saw about him instead of village lights, only in case silhouettes of the forest primeval, he felt that he had made a mistake. Already the taillights were receding. Mur, Copewell rubbed his eyes and inquired of his subjective self whether he were still dreaming. His subjective self said. Thereupon Mur, Copewell sprinted after the taillights. Mur, Copewell was going some, but the shriek of the whistle drowned his shouting, and the rear-end lanterns were whisked like runaway comets from before his outstretched hands. He stumbled on a projecting tie, and the train was gone. The wedding guest who beat his breast because his journey to the ceremony was interrupted had no valid cause of complaint as compared with this would-be bridge room who stood bereft on the cinders. He dropped limply to the ground and covered his face with his hands. About him stretched the unbroken gloom of singular blackness. Nowhere was the glimmer of a light. Nowhere, it seemed, was a human habitation. Somewhere a girl was rushing on an express train toward a broken tryst. No one would meet her save a woman-hating best man. What could he do? For a time he did nothing but sit stunned in the darkness, a hundred yards from his abandoned baggage. It was in just such disparate exigencies as this that chagrined warriors of antiquity were wont to fall upon their swords. Unhappily he had no sword upon which to fall. In the midst of crisis and defeat he sat and strove to evolve out of chairs some bright plan by which he, stranded in juxtaposition to the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, might, in the space of a few minutes, transport himself across an unknown distance and be married at Jaffa Junction. It has been commented that at the average wedding the bridge room has a minor and insignificant role. Mur Copewell had discovered a sure method in the parlance of theatrical folk of fattening the part. The male contracting party has only to stay away. Suddenly he was aroused out of his apathy by the realization that he was not the only living being in that section of rural America. The discovery brought both surprise and comfort. There had drifted to his ears a plaintive singing voice, evidently not far away. The voice was a tenor and it floated through the thick night with the insistent melancholy of a lone minstrel who sings in adversity. Mur, Copwell could quite plainly distinguish the words of the ballad. They were these. J. Good's daughter afore she died, Don signed a paper, so de bums can't ride. There was a silence, then the voice swelled and grew more melancholy as though the singer were invoking verse and notes for the voicing of his own piteous plight. Or, if they do ride, they must ride the rods and trust their souls in the hands of God. The voice dwelt lingeringly on the final chord, then broke off in a deep-drawn sigh. Suddenly it flashed on Mur, Copewell that there was need of quick action. For a while the minutes could hardly be too full of action. Introducing Mur, Rat Connors. The gentleman whose voice Mur, Copewell heard singing beside him in the wilderness was not himself without his troubles. Trouble resembles the star in the drama who comes in various makeups and reading various lines, but always demanding the center of the stage and claiming the white glare of the spotlight. Mur, Copwell, longing for the soft voice of the lady of his heart, believed in his soul that no misfortune could equal that of a marriage ruthlessly interrupted by the chance hostility of fate. Mur, Rat Connors was equally certain that destiny does her worst when she thwarts a dash for freedom and fortune. Mur, Rat Connors had more than a bowing acquaintance with vicissitude, the hope scuttling lord of life. Vicissitude, in its latest guise, had come wearing the mantle of reform to the city of Mercerville, where rich treasures had heretofore awaited enterprise, and where the new regime had blasted prospects. Mur, Connors wished most wishfully that the gentleman responsible for this spoil sport amendment of regime were, for two minutes, in his power, and that he held in his right hand a serviceable fragment of lead pipe. Only last night a warning had been given him at Corkill's exchange that it would be most expedient for him to leave town. Corkill's exchange was in the argot of such as Moore, Connors. 
de dump where de wood is past or cut loose or lie low. The word just now was not merely to lie low but to flee far. The bartender had confided. And beat it. De new chief ain't going to run things on de old plan. De bulls ain't going to take de divi and keep deir faces shut no more. Mgarvis do ter get de axe. If you hangs round here, you'll be ditched and settled and decayed rowed away, see? Mgarvi tipped dat off hisself and it's straight. He said de best he could do for yous guys was to warn yous to make quick getaways, see? This advice, being interpreted, meant that an end had come to the old regime under which Corkill's exchange had operated as a neutral zone where police and criminals maintained an intent cordial on a monetary basis. That was the work of the Han, Alexander Hamilton Burrow and his confreres. It was very inconvenient for Mur, Rat Connors. So Mur, Connors, being just then short of funds, had planned a double event in the way of a flight and a coat. There was a certain country house near Perryville where the treasure was alluring, and if Mur, Connors could reach it he thought he saw a way to mend his fortunes. It was the journey thither which... Captain! Fellow had frustrated, but to return to immediate conditions Mur... Copewell wished to learn the time. He struck a match to consult his watch. Then he groaned again. His watch had stopped. Without knowledge of the hour he was a storm-tossed mariner deprived of a compass. In a rudimentary fashion the paralyzed brain of Murr, Copewell had begun to take up again the task of thought. Thought had carried him this far. Mary Ashton would necessarily take one of the horns of her dilemma. She would either leave the train at Jaffa Junction, as per program, to find herself at the mercy of a rude and woman-hating man, or she would receive a quick and unsoftened warning from the aforesaid brutal person in which event she would continue on her way heartbroken to Auntie and Europe. If she were indeed marooned at Jaffa Junction, the essential thing was to establish communication with that point. Hence, the first step was to find a telephone. If, on the other hand, Burrow had warned her, the one indispensable step was to flag the eastbound train as it passed his own isolated spot. Without knowledge of time or place he could not risk leaving the track because he could have no idea when the train might pass. Perhaps this minstrel, whose voice had come to him through the curtain of darkness, might have a watch. Perhaps he might become an Ollie. Without a lantern, Mur, Copewell could not flag the train unless he built a fire. Obviously, therefore, he must kindle a blaze and open negotiations with the unknown singer. Under the sudden stimulus of revivified hope, Mur, Copewell became facetious. Hello, you, Caruso. Even before Mur, Copewell hailed him, Mur, Connors had noted that the man who appeared in the night so near him was dressed too well to be a fellow vagabond. His photographic eyes had recorded this fact when the sputtering match had caught a red reflection on the watch case with the glint and color of gold. It might have been wiser, reflected Mur, Connors, to have remained silent and slipped up on this gentleman in the official capacity of a thief in the night. His telltale song had, however, made that impossible, so he decided upon permitting events to shape themselves. If it came to a crisis, Rat had in his inside pocket his, which was of, thirty-eight caliber and dependable. Hello yourself, Bo. Responded Mur, Connors with affability. Did you get rowed off to Dangler too? Inquired Mur, Copwell. It began to dawn on him that this person might after all be an undesirable companion. Did your light on your neck off and de hurry up train? Elucidated the other, coming amicably forward and striking a match, the two men regarded each other in the temporary illumination. Said Mur, Copewell. I got off by mistake, same here. Declared Mur, Connors, de conductor guy made de mistake. De brakeman helped him. For a moment, Mur, Copwell stood hesitant. Mur, Connors was not just the man he would have selected to assist in retrieving his disastrously threatened life, but there was small choice of collaborators. 
he demanded. Mine has stopped. Sorry, replied Mur Connors with a grin. I loaned me ticker to Rapal. Mur Copewell turned on his heel and began foraging for firewood. Mur Connors looked on without comment. When the blaze was at last glowing prosperously, its radius of light revealed to him the suitcase which lay near the track a short distance away. Now I don't know you and you don't know me. Tersely began Mur Copewell. It is vitally important to me to telephone to Jaffa Junction. When the Eastern Express comes by, it is also important to flag it. Do you know this country? Do you know where there's a farmhouse? Mur Connors shook his head. Neither do I. Went on Mur Copewell. Now, whatever you do for me, you get paid for. I can't be in two places at once and I'm going to hunt for a phone. I'll be back shortly, but if I miss the train I want you to flag it and ask whether Miss Ashton is on board. If she is, you must give the conductor a note for her. Mur Connors was eyeing the suitcase. He thought the absence of the other men would afford him a better chance to investigate its possible value. Was his ready response. I'd do most anything for a Paul. Mur Copewell tore a page from his notebook and hastily scribbled this message. Dearest, I'm caught in the mill of the inexorable. I can't explain now. I'll follow you to Europe and it will only mean a delay. I love you. Reserve judgment and you will understand. He then plunged into the smothering tangle of the hills. Had he been told that there existed in his state such void and unpeopled wastes, he would, as a patriotic citizen, have resented the charge. He clambered a tree, remembering that all the correspondence courses in Woodcraft advise survey from an eminence. The net results were a bark-scraped face, bruised shins and spoiled wedding clothes. But at last, with a leap of joy, he descried a dim light off to the left. Where there are lights there is humanity and where there is humanity there may be information, possibly even a telephone. He had meant to remain close enough to the track to reach it if he heard the train whistle, but this light lured him like a marsh fire, through briars and over deceptive distances. At last it grew steady and Mur Copewell went forward at an encouraged trot. A rise of ground confronted him. He rushed across it as though he were charging fate's artillery. He did not know that the ridge was in reality the brush-cloaked edge of a steep river bank, any more than he knew that the light he sought was on the opposite side of the stream. He became apprised of both facts, however, a half-second later, when the ground dropped out from under him and he found himself floundering in cold, deep water. Handicapped by the weight of his clothes, he made the bank after two or three highly problematical minutes a raving in the unbeautiful condition of a drenched rat. The ascent of the sticky acclivity contributed a coating of mud. As he turned miserably back he heard the approaching rumble of an express locomotive. Mur, Copewell broke wildly through the thicket toward his fire, half a mile away. Neither his exterior nor his rate of speed accorded with that staid dignity which should characterize a man going to meet his fair young bride. Mur Copewell, however, had lost his sense of proportion. He did not care. What he wanted was to get there. The sound of the oncoming train grew louder. Mur Copewell attained a higher rate of speed. The sweat poured into his bulking eyes. The rumble grew, gathering into a crescendo, then dropped down the scale of sound with diminuendo. He knew the train had passed. It had not stopped. It had not hesitated. The engineer was getting a good forty-five miles an hour out of his boilers. As a capstone to his arch of misfortune, an outcropping root caught Mur Copwell's tree and threw him headlong into a deep cut. It began to look as though in the question of his marriage, the nays had it. A very definite pain in the chest and shoulder told him that something had broken. He staggered to his feet and went more slowly. A torment in one ankle retarded him also, 
there was no further need of hurrying. At the fire he discerned the peacefully recumbent figure of Mer Connors, his head pillowed on the suitcase. Why and didn't you stop that train? Bald Mer, Copewell in futile frenzy, confided Mer, Rat Connors placidly. I just gets drowned off in one dangler, see? I ain't going to take chances stopping no flares in places like this. It ain't healthy. Meself, I knows when I gets plenty. Didn't you agree to do it? Screamed Mer, Copwell choking and sputtering like a cataleptic maniac, smiled Mer, Connors. But I loses me no waves, see. He did not add that he had accomplished his real object when he had rifled the suitcase and that his promise had been purely strategic. Mer, Copwell sank down by the fire. Perhaps it was the shock of the wedding and a broken clavicle. Perhaps it was despair and pain combined. The blood in his temples seemed to be cascading into his eyeballs and flooding his sight with red. Slowly, Mer, Copewell crumpled forward in a senseless heap on the stone ballasted right of way. Mer, Connors, rolling a cigarette, was startled by the collapse of his vis avis. He rose and went over to investigate. He studied the face and its pallor impressed him. Mer, Rat Connors stood indicted for several dozen felonies. More cities claimed him living than ever claimed Homer dead. The fact that he was at large was sufficient evidence of his criminal efficiency. Yet at times he felt that a carrier of great promise was seriously handicapped by a tendency towards soft-heartedness. Now his hands played over the prostrate body as deftly as though the fingers were experimenting with the combination of a safe. The diagnosis told him that a rib and a collarbone were broken. There might be also other breakages, but these two were patent on a cursory inventory. Now if that ain't... Snarled Mer Connors. I'll eat a goat. He sat down and brooded bitterly. He had been booted off a train and had dropped into the company of a stranger. By virtue of helplessness, this stranger became an enforced trust upon the unwilling hands of Mer Connors until he could be turned over to someone else. Mutual misfortune created a certain tay of brotherhood. Mer Connors scorned the quitter who abandoned even a chance pull in a state of wounded disability. Every profession has its ethics. There was, however, no ethical objection to robbing the invalid's pockets. Mer Connors was a socialist. This man had money. Mer Connors had none. It was equitable that the extremes of wealth and poverty be leveled. Profound thinkers have enunciated this principle. Mer Connors bent over and proceeded to carry into effect the socialistic propaganda by the simple device of searching every pocket. Mer Copewell had drawn his check that day with a view to meeting the requirements of honeymooning, and honeymooning is an expensive pastime. The eyes of Mer Rat Connors bulged and glittered in the firelight as he counted bills and made transfers. Then Mer Connors dragged the prostrate figure farther back into the shadow and arranged it as comfortably as possible on the grass. After that he piled fresh sticks on the blaze. Now I've got to find some hoosier to look after this guy Soliloquized the unwilling custodian. Gee, but it's to be soft-hearted. He paused and felt through his coat the thick wad of bills in his pocket. He added with deep sorrow. With a bun like that, you could beat a turdy North Pole, too. Mer Connor struck off at random into the night, singing mournfully as he went. J. Good's daughter, afore she died, done signed a paper so de bums can't ride. Mer Burrow suggests a remedy. The Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow had been something like two hours in Jaffa Junction. Two whores in Jaffa Junction is more than sufficient for any man. For the Han, Alexander the Knight held nothing save the melancholy prospect of seeing a friend abandon himself to the emotional insanity of marriage. For marriage, Mur, Burrow had no tolerance. For woman, he had a supreme contempt. When the train which should have borne his friend whisked through and brought no cope well, the best man became testy. 
Mur, Burrow reflected that this development left him to take charge of an unclaimed lady whom he did not want. He found the idea disconcerting. Decidedly, he must devise some escape. Then an inspirational idea dawned. He would rush up to her pullman when it arrived. He would shout warningly, On your way! Your lunatic didn't come! That ought to solve the situation very nicely. First, though, he would call up Mercerville and find out what had happened. Calling up Mercerville from Jaffa Junction proved an undertaking of such magnitude that Mer Burroughs' grouch ripened slowly into misanthropy before it was accomplished. The telephone exchange, instead of being central in location, seemed to have been placed on the principle of an eruptive hospital in faraway isolation. When at last he got Copwell's lodgings it was to learn that Copwell had left on the westbound express. As the Honorable Mur Burrow came down the stairs of the telephone exchange the shriek of a train whistle smote discordantly on his ears. The motor proved balky and required a singular amount of cranking. The cranking required a superlative amount of profanity. Altogether the series of petty annoyances spelled delay. The station was quite a distance away and Mur Burrow proceeded to desecrate the speed limit, rehearsing as he went. On your way, young woman. He didn't come. And Miss Ashitton, alighting on the station platform, was startled to find it empty. She had expected it to be filled with the welcoming presence of Mur Copewell. Her alarm was at once dissipated, however, by the glare of Isidilin headlights whirling around the curve of the road some distance away. The mad speed of the approaching car indicated that it was her own private reception committee. She set down her suitcase and waited. MacDonald also saw the automobile headlights. He knew that automobiles were not indigenous to Jaffa Junction. This one could mean only that Miss Ashitton was being properly and enthusiastically met. A moment later the best man alighted at the station and looked regretfully after the train. He had been too late. Mur Burrow had not considered the possible effect on Miss Ashitton of his contemplated bluntness. It had not mattered. Mur Burrow had the military mind. The military mind cannot pause to consider the feelings of the enemy. Decimation is painful to an army but desirable to the attacking general. The military mind sees and pursues one object. Mur Burroughs' one object was to rid himself of a superfluous young female. It was the same thing that makes some warriors slay prisoners rather than be burdened with them on the march. For an appreciable space of time the Han, Alexander Hamilton, Burrow eyed Miss Asherton with this politeness. She looked back at him inquiringly. There was nothing ardent in the table you. Hazarded the Han, Alexander. The man had no idea the monosyllable could be so short. Her voice was so musical that it was altogether too short. I'm a burrow. I'm the best man. Yes, but where is Lewis? Miss Ashton put the question with a pardonable eagerness. Conversely, her voice conveyed an entire absence of interest in the best man. All the weddings I have ever attended, said Mur. Burrow sententiously, were marred by some slight hitch or omission. At this one the missing detail seems to be the bridegroom. Having spoken, he awaited her hysterics. It happened that Miss Ashton was not the hysterical sort. She merely looked at Moore, Burrow, and Moore, Burrow suddenly felt himself grow microscopic. Also he was puzzled. This young woman had planned to elope with Moore, Lewis Copewell. That indicated that she must consider Mur Lewis Copewell a desirable possession. He had just announced, with studied bluntness, that she could not have Mur Copewell. Why did she not take the coup and weep? He regarded it as axiomatic that women and children cry for what they want. Yet here before him, in the full glare of the acetylene lamps, she stood eyeing him like an offended young goddess, precisely as though he were responsible and she meant to punish him.
Mm. Burrow had not arranged his battlefront to receive that type of enemy. It dawned upon him that this was a very brave young woman, and, although he admitted it reluctantly, a very beautiful young woman. She suggested Italy. You might explain more fully. On the whole, I think I have the right to understand. Mur Burrow shrugged at his shoulders. My dear Miss Asherton, he began with weak defiance, yet feeling that she had put him on the defensive. Might I remind you that this is not my funeral, that is to say, my wedding. All I can learn is that he left Mercerville and did not arrive here. The question which now suggests itself to me is this, what are the functions of a best man when there is no marriage? The young woman turned away and marched scornfully toward the far end of the platform. It was revealed to Mur, Burrow, that if all women could walk like that and take punishment like that, there would be no room in the world for woman haters. His objections to marriage could not apply to a union with a deity. Miss Asherton. He began. The girl wheeled with her chin in the air and an angry gleam flashed through the mortified tearfulness of her eyes. Will you kindly go away? She said in a peremptory voice. Mur Burrow skulked back crestfallen. He sat dismally on the step of his automobile and fanned himself with his cap. He was very busy heading himself. Afterward she came over, walking very straight, and halted rigidly before him. Will you be good enough to take me to a telephone? Mur Burrow rose with a new alacrity and put out his hand to assist her. She drew carefully away from his touch and opened the tiny door for herself. Into Mur Burrow's self hatred crept a note of self pity. Won't you, won't you sit in front? He timidly suggested, It will be easier to talk. It's not necessary to talk. The young lady informed him. The run to the telephone exchange was made in heavy and depressing silence. Can't get Mercerville any more before tomorrow. Enlightened the operator briefly. Lime's in trouble, something's just busted. Demanded Mur Burrow. All out. Long way out. Nothing doing until 10.30 tomorrow morning. Mur Burrow thought it inconceivably strange that anyone could be facetious at such a time. Where's the telegraph operator? He inquired coldly, gone to the country. Office closed till tomorrow. I suppose there is some sort of hotel. Suggested the even voice of the girl at his elbow. If you will take me there I shan't trouble you any farther. Began Mur Burrow, then he began again. But, but, the girl threw up her head. She even managed to laugh a little. She questioned sweetly. You've said that four times. But, but, stammered Mur Burrow again. The Han Alexander was usually regarded as a loquacious man. I suppose some day when I get the perspective on it, it will all be rather humorous. It would make a good farce, wouldn't it? Only now it doesn't seem exactly funny. Mur Burrow gave up the problem of articulation. He raised the hood of the car and adjusted something. When he came back he appeared to have regained the power of speech. He said. His hands were greasy, so he procured a bunch of waste from the toolbox and carefully wiped each ticket. Having accomplished this task to his satisfaction, he boldly returned and thrust his right out to Miss Asherton. I know that I don't deserve quarter, but you are the gamest sport I ever saw, and I want to be able to tell my grandchildren that I once shook hands with you, after which I am going down on my marrow bones and make my most contrite obeisances. Miss Asherton did not this time repudiate the amenities. She smiled forgiveness. Why were you so atrociously horrid? She asked, as though the psychology of his behavior mildly piqued her interest. You see, I was a woman hater. Oh, are you? How interesting! Hotly denied Mur Burrow. 
but you just said... I just said I was. There's a big difference between saying you were something and saying you are something. Life is a matter of tenses. Do you know what a woman hater is? Inquired Mur Burrow as the car nosed its way deliberately along Jaffa Junction's principal esplanade. Certainly. Replied Miss Asherton. It's a man who thinks he's a little wiser than other men, and who is, in fact, she hesitated politely. Who may be mistaken? Savagely supplemented Mur Burrow. Who's such a blank dashed fool that he glories in his folly? Until ten minutes ago, I was one of them. Miss Ashitton said nothing. It occurred to the Honorable Alexander that she might be thinking of Lewis Cupwell. The thought filled him with hot indignation. Who was Lewis Cupwell that a goddess playing truant from Olympus should trouble her decorative head about him? Thinking of the decorative head, Mur Burrow turned in his seat to contemplate it. The car veered into the ditch but without casualty. Houses sit along Jaffa Junction's thoroughfares as Chinese beds are strung at extended intervals. Illumination is yet in the future. The ways are dark. Besides Ran Mur, Burrow's train of thought if Lewis Copewell wanted her, why wasn't he on hand to claim her? If he, the Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow, was to be dragged scores of miles to act as a human dead letter office for unclaimed girls, surely he was justified in taking possession in his own distinguished person. The circumstances emancipated him from any quixotic ideas of loyalty to Lewis Copewell. He turned again to the passenger in the tonneau. Aren't you afraid you'll ditch your car if you keep turning around? Quietly inquired Miss Ashton, acknowledged Mur Burrow. Perhaps it would be safer for you to sit in front. I'm effervescing with repartees scintillating with epigram. You need to be amused. It will take your thoughts off of your temporary annoyances and prevent brooding. Brooding is bad. Possibly even that wouldn't distract my mind. She ventured, then run the car suggested the Honorable Alexander, surrendering his place. The more you have to do just now, the better for you. The less I have to do, the better I can talk. Miss Ashton took the wheel. The arrangement gave Mur Burrow the opportunity to study her profile as she watched the road. It occurred to Mur Burrow that he had hitherto lost much out of life by neglecting to study profiles. Then came the realization that after all this was the only profile in the world. Began that gentleman cheerfully. This little hitch in your plans is not really so fatal as it seems. It's funny that he didn't get off the train. Yes, it's so funny that there's no use trying to explain it. Mur Burrow assured her. And I don't know what to do. She continued. I have a perfectly rational and logical plan. One, in fact, which I regard as an improvement on the original. What is it? This somewhat doubtfully, Miss Ashton saw no fault with the previous arrangement. Now you came here to get married, didn't you? She admitted. Was the idea, but never give up a purpose. Interrupted Mur. Burrow with a note of steadfast resolve. You came to get married. Do it. But... Her voice trembled just a little. But I can. How can I? Nothing simpler. Just do as I say. She turned her face from the wheel and gazed at him in wonderment. How? I was on hand. I'm ready, but with Lewis. You came here to get married. Insistently repeated Mur Burrow. You passed up a trip to Europe and left Auntie waiting in Mercerville. I came here to get you married and passed up a ninth ward meeting in Mercerville. That wedding must take place. Her eyes gazed out at the road, under brows wrinkled with bewilderment. Mur Burrow looked at her a moment in silence, then spoke with great impressiveness. 
a woman owes it to herself to marry the best man obtainable. I am in my official capacity, the best man. Marry me. I am very much at your service, and it may not be irrelevant to add that I love you. The immediate effect of this announcement was that the girl at the wheel threw on the brakes and stopped the car with a jolt which almost sent her suitor caroming through the windshield. Next she turned and sat staring at Mur Burrow with an expression of absolute and paralyzed incredulity. Mur Burrow felt that he had failed to make himself quite clear. I concede that it's a trifle abrupt, but I am essentially a man of action. Some dilatory fools might take a month to discover that without you life is a superfluous byproduct. The Honorable Alexander thought contemptuously of Mur Cupwell. It is enough for me to see you. Besides, Europe yawns for you, and it's bad luck to postpone a marriage. Possibly when you know me, you'll like me. If you don't, I'll remodel myself according to your specifications. Phraseology notwithstanding, there was sincerity in Mur Burrow's voice. Said the girl at last, speaking a trifle vaguely. Your courtist proposal seems to cover every possible point except one. The one is Lewis Copewell. Really, you know, I didn't just come here to get married at random. She started the mechain forward again. I assure you there's nothing random about me. Argued the Honorable Alexander with dignity. In matrimonial matters. She told him, One can't eliminate the element of personal preference. I still prefer Lewis. Mur Burroughs sighed. Even deities, it seemed, had undiscriminating tastes. He said wearily. The girl looked at the uninviting facade of the building indicated. It suggested the kennel of a dog in very modest circumstances. This a hotel. Yes. Said the man. It isn't a very good hotel. The county judge lives on the next square. He can perform the marriage ceremony, you know, and his house is much nicer. Shall we go on? We will get out here. Said Miss Ashitton firmly. Though it was midnight, it chanced that the hotel office was not completely deserted. Through the open door struggled the yellow glimmer of a coal oil lamp, and its reek hung offensively on the sultriness. Two drummers with loosened neckbands and hanging suspenders were beguiling the heavy whores with a deck of grazy cards. Dozing in dishabille sat mine host, his chair propped on two legs against the wall and his snore proclaiming him in the shadow. The arrival of a beautiful woman and a man in motortugs brought the drummers to their feet with an exclamation which aroused the innkeeper. That worthy rubbed his eyes and began in a wheezing voice. I'm afraid it's going to be kinder on handy to take care of you folks. The house is mighty nigh full up. Before Mur Barrow could reply, one of the drummers rose chivalrously to the occasion. The gent and his wife can take my room, if Mur Sellers here don't mind my doubling up with him. The drummer had been marooned an entire day in Jaffa Junction. For a glimpse of that face at the breakfast table he would gladly have slept on the roof. Mur Burrow cleared his throat, but before he could find words, Mur Sellers graciously declared that he would be much pleased to oblige. Then, while Miss Ashitton stood painfully impersonating the Aurora Borealis, the Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow astounded her with these composed words. I am sure you gentlemen are both very kind. But if you will pardon me a moment, I will consult with her with my wife. Since the space of the hotel office was limited in scope to something like ten by twenty feet, partly preempted by a cigar counter, the two drummers exchanged glances and rose, with innate delicacy, disappearing into the street. Mine host, prompted by the same latent courtesy, disappeared up the stairs. Then Miss Ashton turned a whitely angry face on the Honorable Alexander. She could hardly have confronted him more belligerently had she really been his spouse. My dear young lady. Expostulated Mur Burrow humbly. You don't know Jaffa Junction. 
you arrive unchaperoned. If I had corrected our Calvinistic host, he would have turned us both out like Perius. Will you please drive me to Mercerville? Certainly. Director Veya, the county judges. Direct and fast, said Miss Ashitton with decision. Please consider, urged the Honorable Alexander. It is now past midnight. Mercerville is ten hours away either by motor or train. It will be a trifle difficult to explain to Auntie. It will be a trifle difficult in any event. On the contrary, I should not feel called upon to make any explanation whatsoever as to the movements of myself and my wife. Mer Burroughs spoke with some hauteur. The young woman ignored the suggestion. She said, The roads are very bad, and one tire is a little weak. We will go on. You are spoiling the most improved elopement that was ever devised. Sighed the Honorable Alexander mournfully. It breaks my heart to witness such iconoclasm. Murmured Miss Ashton mechanically. One hour and a half later, as the car turned a sharp curve, there came a loud report, a sudden jolt, and a long-suffering sigh from Mer Burrow. He said in a voice of deep resignation, Was the rear, left than tire, and I should say that as a blowout there was some class to it. Chapter Via Mer Ratconner's Samaritan When Mer Rat Connors dropped out of sight over the railroad embankment his ideas of procedure had been somewhat vague. In the United States were some eighty million people. It seemed a fair sporting proposition, and one worth a small bet, that out of that number at least a single individual must have residence in this neighborhood. If he sought hard enough he might find that habitation. Himself, he would have preferred a night's lodging under the broad and starry skies to a quest of the sort he had undertaken. But the other gentleman was in bed, and the tenets of Mur, Rat Connor's primitive knighthood precluded the possibility of leaving him late, suffering and unsuccored. The search was for a while futile. The timbered hills stretched unbroken in lines of ragged shadow. It was a nob country, surrendered even in the narrow valleys, to the crawfish and the crow, save for a few scattered cabin dwellers who cultivated peach orchards on the sterile slopes of the hills. But at last Mer Connors came upon a sort of trail which seemed to be the poor relation to a road. Mer Connors set his feet therein and trudged on with what comfort and companionship he could derive from Jagood's daughter personified in song. At last he came upon a point where, through a gap in the timber line, he saw a dilapidated and almost shapeless bulk etched darkly against the star punctured sky. Now disclaiming any intention to speak with aspersion of Mur Connors, it must be said that his profession made his habits largely nocturnal. Men who operate in darkness share with the cat the power to use their eyes where the honest householder would find himself blind. To Mur Connors the wellly shapeless mass defined itself into a building, and the erect projection at its top into a modest steeple, proclaiming it a A church on a hill in the middle of the night offers little encouragement to a man seeking living aid. Toppling smudges of lighter grey flanked its walls, telling of men and women who slept in the enclosure, but these men and women were all dead. The smudges were their gravestones. The eyes of Mur Connors went farther back, penetrating the darkness, and discovered a second and more indistinct pile. That might be the parsonage. Mur Connors halted for reflection. Churches were establishments distinctly out of his line. Parsons were gentlemen engaged in a different, even a hostile, profession. On the other hand, churchmen might be expected to lend an attentive ear to tales of distress. Mur Rat Connors turned into the churchyard, shivering instinctively as he passed among the graves. Mur Connors was a simple soul easily awed by the great phenomenon of death. No lights shone from the windows or doors of the house in the rear. At this hour honest folk slept in that vicinity. Before the house hung a rickety gate, and Mur 
Connors had his hand on the latch when his entire plan of campaign underwent sudden revision. He had intended entering the gate, proceeding up the grass-grown walk and hammering at the front door. Instead, he went fleetly up the fence, paused on its top only long enough to grasp an overarching branch, then swung himself precipitately into a convenient tree. The cause of this sudden change of itinerary remained below, since it is the wise dispensation of providence that dogs cannot climb trees. The cause, however, in his sudden heat and passion, did not seem willing to admit that providence had acted wisely in the matter. He gave evidence of a desire to pursue Mur, Connors into the upper branches. It was clear that the cause was given to violent and hasty prejudices, and that Mur, Connors had aroused such a prejudice. The dog squatted below and leaped into the air. When he alighted, he leaped again. Mur, Connors, straddling a limb, the strength of which was not guaranteed, was ready to admit without careful that the animal was jumping some. The brute seemed gifted with an almost Rooseveltian strenuousness and sincerity. Even in his moments of resting between efforts there was a grim determination in his pose which indicated his intention of remaining until Mur, Connors came down. For a time he was silent, save for an occasional snarl then he sent his voice a-chewing belligerently across the hills. Lord Byron says, It is sweet to hear the honest watchdogs bay. Lord Byron was, no doubt, quite sincere in the assertion, it all depends on the point of view. It is safe to assume that Lord did not compose that line while clinging to a bending tree limb with the honest watchdog baying at the exact spot upon which he would fall if the branch broke. Something must be done. The force of habit is strong. So often had Mur Connors found it necessary to cover his movements with a cloak of silence when approaching a dwelling house in the night time that it did not occur to him for some minutes to shout for help from within. Then he remembered that this time he was not on burglary bent. He lifted his voice in competition with that of the dog and shouted madly. At last the door of the house opened and a timid female voice inquired who was calling and why he was calling. Explained Mur Connors from his perch in the tree. The explanation was candid yet it seemed insufficient. Who are you and what are you doing up my tree? Demanded the voice a shade more boldly, apologized Mur Connors with some irony. I didn't get no time to ask whose tree it was. What are you doing up there? Replied Mur Connors. He put me here. From the dog came a growl which entirely corroborated Mur Connors on the point in question. The slit of light in the door remained just wide enough to permit a shawl-wrapped head to protrude. The dog fell silent. He appeared to recognize that his was now a thinking part, but he relaxed nothing in vigilance of pose. As the parley proceeded he squatted below, ominously alert, a beast cutchant waiting his coup to take again the center of the stage. There was a painful pause. Say, suggested Mur Connors at last, if you're scared to talk to me, send out some of the men folks. I ain't dangerous. I won't hurt them. The men folks are all away. Replied the voice, growing timid once more. And I guess you had better stay where you are till they get home. When are you looking for him back? Inquired Mur Connors courteously. The branch was made of hard wood and it was a very knotty bit of timber the length of time he might be required to occupy it was interesting. The rustic mind runs to loquacity. The woman found herself explaining in more detail than the circumstances required. My husband is the minister. My son is the justice of the peace. They have both gone up the river, but the boat is due at the landing in an hour or so unless it is late. You might as well wait a while and see them. Mur Connors groaned from the depths of his soul. In an hour or so, unless the boat was late, pleaded Mur Connors in his most ingratiating voice. I come here looking for a doctor, see. 
When a guy goes to get a doctor, it ain't right to butt in and stop him. That's the way it looks to a man up a tree, lady. The woman ventured no opinion. She merely closed the door. Lady! Shouted Mur Connors in his most humble and winning manner. The door opened again. Well, what is it? Lady, I come here to get help for a guy that's lying on the railroad track with a busted slat. He ain't got nobody to look after him. If you keeps me up here, there ain't no telling what'll happen to the poor afflicted feller. A man with a busted what? Inquired the lady suspiciously, repeated Mur Connors. This guy falls down a cliff and caves in a few spare ribs. That's on the level, lady. I ain't kidding with you. You mean the man is wounded? That's it. He's all in and down and out. Where, where is this person? The minister's wife put the question with preliminary symptoms of relenting. If someone were genuinely in distress, she must prove the facts. Right up the railroad about three quarters of a mile from here. The lady was considering. While she did so, the beast below made a sound as if licking his chops with the relish of keen anticipation. When my husband and son come home, they will investigate your story. Of course, they may not get home tonight. The boat is usually a few hours late. Once more, Mur Connors groaned. Added the lady. I'll call off the dog. You can, Vamos. Mur Connors' voice was eager. But, continued the warning voice, the dog will be about all evening, and if you come back, me come back, lady. Mur Connors' voice trembled with emotion. Forget it. This is me farewell appearance. The lady opened the door a little wider. She commanded. Come here. Here, Fado. That's a good little doggy. Thirty seconds later, Mur Connors dropped to the ground and disappeared. Mur Lewis Cupwell resumed consciousness to find himself apparently deserted. With the reawakening of his mental activities came a renewed horror of the situation which engulfed him. He must find a telephone. He struggled to his feet. But while he slept, his injuries had been multiplying and his joints stiffening. He breathed with difficulty. Also, he could not walk. One ankle had swollen until his shoe bounded like a vise, and when he stepped forward, he fell with nauseating pain to the broken rocks. The following is a true capitulation of the casualties suffered by Mur Copwell one broken collar bone, one broken rib, one sprained ankle. Mur Copewell was not a man of flimsy courage. In order to send a single reassuring word to the lady he loved, he would gladly have waded through blood, but one cannot wade successfully through blood on one foot. He could not even walk along a railroad track on one foot. He tried hopping and found it on the whole an unsatisfactory means of locomotion. Then Mur Copewell crawled back to his suitcase and sat down again in despair. Mur. Lewis Copwell was not astonished that his chance companion should, as it seemed, have abandoned him in his adversity. His meeting with Mur Connors had been merely casual. Finding himself converted without warning from a voyager bound for the enchanted Isles where a beauteous maiden awaited him into a wrecked and battered derelict, his course had drifted across that of a second derelict. The second derelict had stood by for a time and offered him some slight aid, then had drifted on, abandoning him to the mercy of winds and tides. As Mur Copewell's harrowed mind dwelt on the analogy of his shipwrecked life, he realized that instead of being a friend, this black haired youth was in fact his nemesis, his evil genius. In the waste places of the sea float dangerous, half sunken craft that menace the traffic of the ocean lanes. Good ships bear down on these submerged hulks and yawning holes are driven into seaworthy prows. Such a drifting peril was the black-haired youth. But for him the train would have gone on uninterruptedly to Jaffa Junction, 
and the hopeless and argosy of myrrh, Copewell's existence would have made its happy port. But for this creature's perfidy, Mur, Copewell himself would have remained by his fire and flag at the eastern train, at least establishing communication with the civilized world. So he might have snatched victory out of defeat. But now! Now there loomed before him only the ignominy and bitterness of a life spoiled in the making. In all maritime law it is meet and proper when a seafaring man encounters a drifting derelict to destroy it. Mur Copewell wished wholeheartedly for an opportunity to dispose of Mur Connors. Yet, even as he brooded vengefully, Mur Connors was parleying in his behalf with a clergyman's wife, while a clergyman's dog of untristian temper licked his fangs beneath. A pistol and a puncture. Having by soft speech won his way out of that parlous plight, Mur Connors was still wearily trudging the abandoned roads of the vicinity in search of succor. His own state of mind was not joyous. Thanks to Mur Copwell's wedding funds, the financial phase of the case had been satisfactorily adjusted, but he was still unsured by responsibility until the man whom fate had thrust upon him could be transferred to other incompetent hands and he was insured, too close for safety, to the reform-infested city of Mercerville. With these drear reflections he tramped along until he came upon another road. It seemed a somewhat more traveled way than the one he had left. Possibly it was the almost abandoned stage road which in ancient days had linked Perryville with the east. Mur Connors extracted from his pocket a five-cent piece. Prior to the rifling of Mur. Copewell's wallet it had been the only buffer between himself and destitution. He could go but one way at once. Heads should guide him east, tails west. Tails it was. A turn in the highway brought him upon quick discovery. Confronting him at some distance glared twin eyes of bright light, throwing broad, luminous shafts along the road. Oh, me mother! ejaculated Murr, Connors in astonishment. If it ain't a benzine buggy, caution being the very sole breath of Mur, Rat Connor's policy, he did not approach the stationary motor car conspicuously by the center of the road. Instead, he dropped into the deep shadow of overhanging trees and made his way forward with the noiselessness of an Indian on a war trail. He meant to see what manner of person piloted the car before he presented his demand for first aid to the injured. He advanced on his toes. The automobile was empty. One of its taillights had been removed and placed on the ground. There it blinked, lighting the work of a solitary man who knelt on a folded robe, swearing also mending a punctured tire. This man was coatless, smeared with grease, covered with dust and panting laboriously. His profanity was voluminous and capable as he struggled with the task of replacing an outer casing on a jacked-up wheel. Mur Connors did not at once emerge from the shadow. He knew that this car could not possibly proceed until the tire was replaced and inflated. He meant to ask a favor, and asking a favor carried with it a certain obligation to reciprocate. Mur Connors had an idea that pumping up the tire of an automobile which looked like a baby battleship would involve a distastful element of manual labor. The evening was hot, and on the whole it might be as well not to interrupt this gentleman until he was through. It pleased Mur Connors to discover, after a careful reconnoiter, that the gentleman was absolutely alone. If he proved obdurate, and a gunplay became necessary, one man would cause less trouble than several. The frayed condition of the gentleman's temper indicated that he might prove obdurate. Canister from his pocket and tested trigger and hammer, if the lone wayfarer quietly accepted the charge of the guy with de busted slave. There need be no friction. If he lacked that large sympathy which should make him a willing rescuer, then he must have philanthropy thrust upon him. Mur Connors meant to thrust it with the pistol. So he gave thanks that this was not a party, nor a couple, but only an unaccompanied chauffeur. When the injured man should be safely stowed in the tonneau, the trusteeship of Mur 
Connors would terminate. Then what? Life has its business exigencies even for those of us who are not materialists. Men who tour in motorcars may be assumed to carry money. Why not first impress the gentleman into service and then relieve him of his valuables? Why should the doctrine of socialism apply as to the man who lay wounded and not as to this one who drove an automobile? The man in the road rose with a sigh of relief. He stretched himself, adjusted the pump, and bent to his labor again. Murr Connor sat watching. At last that too was done. The lone motorist put away his tools and turned wearily. Apparently the sight of the car fatigued him. As he did this Murr, Connor stepped out of the shadow and placed the muzzle of his revolver in impressive juxtaposition with the gentleman's face. The gentleman had fancied himself alone. The discovery that he had been mistaken surprised him. It startled him. Let's see you stretch your arms up high. Suggested Mur Connors, the gentleman obligingly and promptly followed the suggestion. What is this, if I may ask? Highway robbery, some of it is. Mur Connors assured him pleasantly. And some of it's ambulance service. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you. That's all right. You will follow me in about three minutes, replied Mur Connors. But before that, let's see what you've got in your clothes. The motorist offered no verbal protest. When one looks down a gun barrel at one um in a lonely road, silence is eighteen car at fine. This highwayman was carefully keeping a position just too far away for a clinch. At that distance the pistol gave him priority of rank and entitled him to issue orders. Get over dear Indy Light and turn your pockets out. Directed Mur Connors. Throw everything down here by me feet. If you's got a gun in your clothes I wants to see it come out with the muzzle pointed the other way. See? The gentleman saw. I haven't a gun, and... Pursued Mur Connors succinctly. Let's be on the level with each other. Don't let's have no holding back. I wants to see the linens of dem pockets hanging outside. You looks prettier that way. For a moment there was complete silence while pocket contents showered on the grass at Mur Connors' feet. Mur Connors secured for himself the gentleman's coat which hung over the tonneau door. There is a distinction between tribute levee and vandalism. Mur Connors left letters and papers undisturbed, taking only currency and articles of intrinsic value. Then as they stood with Mur Connors unostentatiously in the shadow and the other gentlemen in the full glare of the acetylene lamps, hands high and his pockets inverted, they heard a somewhat startled exclamation in the road. A young woman emerged suddenly from behind the car carrying a bucket of water. The table you had not greeted her eyes until she reached a point where the screening framework ceased to screen. Then it appeared to interest her greatly. Lady. Said Mur Connor steadily, the pistol muzzle never wavering. Or oh, ladies and gents, if there's a bunch of yous, please come round here and get in line and put your hands up. If anybody makes a false move, I croaks this gent and dad goes see. The lady came forward and took up her station by the side of the man. In order to raise her hands she had to set down the canvas bucket with which she was burdened. Standing in the acetylene spotlight, the young woman struck Mur Connors as supremely beautiful. He deplored the necessity of keeping her in a prisoner's attitude, and he admired the calm with which she endured the compulsion. Her eyes even seemed to be dancing a trifle as she looked at the somewhat abject Mur Burrow. She naively requested, Would you mind if I poured some water into the radiator? She added reassuringly, it will keep both hands quite busy. The machine can't go on until we do that, you know, and we'd like to get home when you are entirely through with us. Mur Connors considered the proposition. Go as far as you're like, lady. But let this gent keep close enough for me to watch you both.
If his hands comes down, I'm afraid I'll have to hurt somebody, see? As the young woman lifted the full bucket with a surprising strength for such slender arms, the gentleman assured her that he regretted his inability to assist. The young lady laughed. But that will be about all for this part of the job. Now for the ambulance. The what? Questioned the young woman. I'm sorry to trouble you, lady. Apologized, Mur Connors. But it's like this, there's a guy up the railroad track what's got a busted slat. I's got to borrow your benzene buggy to take him to a doctor. Now see here, you infernal parrot. The gentleman took one belligerent step forward and halted abruptly as he recognized how close it brought him to the ominous muscle. Me? Questioned Mur Connors in an injured tone. I ain't asking nothing. I'm telling you what I want's done, and you don't need to get fresh about it, see? Is there really an injured man? Is this true? Asked the lady. Evidently she was willing to be reasonable. Honest or God, lady? Mur Connors spoke earnestly, and his eyes wore their frankest appeal. This guy is liable to croak if he don't get a doctor. He's a poor skate. Myself, I don't know him personally, but I'm sorry for him. Some disreputable drunk. Growled the gentleman savagely. Some contemptible hobo like this man here. Suggested the young woman in a level voice. That up to this point you have been very obedient to this person you call a contemptible hobo. At all events I'm not going to leave an injured man by the roadside. I'm going with this person. Do you care to come along? Oh, he'll come along all right. Mur Connors assured her. I needs him to run de car. The gentleman's face went white with anger then as he turned his eyes on Mur Connors. His expression grew quizzical, even amused, and a light of sudden recognition came to his pupils. He said with deliberate courtesy of address. I congratulate myself that I have fallen under the bow and spear of so distinguished a crook as yourself. I retract the contemptible hobo. I have just recognized you. Mur Hybro Reformer Burrow. Replied Mur Connors with instant promptness. Thanks for them kind words. May I inquire? Purred Mur Burrow. After you, after you. Returned the young gentleman modestly. How did you get hep to me? Explained the Honorable Alexander Suively. The chief of police was speaking of you this morning. He had a good deal to say about you. Mur Connors grinned, as one whose greatness has been duly recognized. Will you give me best to de chief? Will you tell him I'm well and doing business and I hope he's the same? I shall be honored to do so. Declared the Honorable Alexander gravely. I shall also look forward with pleasure to a meeting when all three of us shall be present you, the Chief and I. But you haven't told me how you came to recognize me. Your name was printed in gold letters on your pocketbook, and I can read. Murmured Mur Burrow. Mur Connors waved his weapon with a gesture of energy. Let's beat it. This busted up guy's labeled her get homesick. A chapter ex On the railroad track. Mur Rat Connors superintended the arrangement of the car. The Honorable Alexander was requested to take the wheel, and the lady to sit at his side. Mur Connors disposed himself in the tonneau from which vantage point he issued orders after the fashion of an admiral from the bridge of his flagship. Two hundred yards from the railroad track, Mur Connors gave the word to halt. Having disembarked, he marshaled his cavalcade in what he deemed the most advisable formation. He suggested, That's the Perlet system. As they took the indicated order of precedence, Mur Connors added, And then if yer makes a break, I won't have to shoot pro de lady to get yer, see. While they were picking their way through a bit of woods, the Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow was moved to speech. 
You see, Miss Asherton Mary, I may call you Mary, mayn't I? Life is full of chances. You need a protector. You had better reconsider and give me the right to act always. But Miss Asherton interrupted him with a clear peal of laughter. Despite the guard at the rear, she halted in her tracks. Certainly you may call me Mary. And you may protect me, too. Protect me now. Take the gun away from this person. The halting of Miss Asherton forced the Honorable Alexander to halt, and the halting of the Honorable Alexander brought the cold muzzle of the revolver against the back of his neck. Move on, dear. Ordered Mer Connors. Cut out the chain music and keep hacking, of course. Said Mer Burrow in a less jaunty voice. There are times when we are at a disadvantage. The protection I alluded to. Suggested Mer Connors. Less of dat come de. Less of it. Mer Burrow fell silent. To have one's tenderest declarations pronounced come de by a critic one is not at liberty to contradict is disconcerting. Then they came to the embankment and were instructed to climb up. On the railroad track they saw three men. One was an elderly gentleman in rusty clerical garb. One was a tall man of a younger generation, but the salient feature of the situation was that between them they supported a third person. Despite mud-smeared clothes and demoralized personal appearance, this third person was clearly recognizable to bright elect and best man as Mer. Lewis Copewell. Mur, Lewis Copewell raised his head and saw standing at the edge of the embankment a rare and radiant maiden whom mortals called Mary Asherton. For an whore, Mur, Lewis Copewell had been demanding of the smoldering logs whether he should ever again clasp this rare and radiant maiden. It was upon this reverie that the minister and his son, the Justice of the Peace, had arrived. And now miracle of miracles. There seemed to stand the lady in the flesh. He tore himself from the supporting arms of the minister and the justice of the peace with an inarticulate roar. Then he proceeded to hop on one foot across the track to find out whether this were a true vision or merely a brain marriage. Miss Mary Asherton took a swift inventory of his injuries and went to meet him. Miss Mary Asherton did not have to hop, and a man can stand quite well on one foot when he has both arms around the only girl in the world. If you don't believe it, try it. It dawned quite suddenly on the Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow that the party was quite complete. Bridegroom, best man, minister, witness, and how should he classify Mer Connors? He swept a comprehensive glance about, but there was no Mer Connors. Mer Connors had vanished into the night as suddenly as he had arisen out of the night. He had played his part and passed. In point of fact, Mer Connors was looking on from the shadow of an autodistant sycamore. Sitting at the foot of this sycamore, he drew from one pocket the gold timepiece that had formerly reposed in the pocket of Mer Lewis Copewell. Then he abstracted from another pocket the watch that had been, until a short time ago, worn by the Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow. Then he affectionately patted the rolls of greenbacks in his braced pocket. He optimistically told himself. For a moment there was silence on the railroad track. Then Mer Copewell, feeling quite assured that the vision was genuine, managed to say, Mary! Miss Ashitton said. The Honorable Alexander Hamilton Burrow, thinking of nothing witty or timely to say, touched the minister on the arm and began feeling in his pockets for the marriage license. Transcribers note this story appeared in the September 1911 issue of Adventure magazine.